Hi, welcome to our interview show in which we interview LGBTQ guests who are important contributors to our community. We want to acknowledge that All Things LGBTQ is produced at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which is unceded indigenous land. Enjoy the show. So, so joining us today has to be one of the most in-demand women in Vermont right now. She is the President Pro Tem elect. Please welcome back one of our favorite guests, Becca Ballant. Thank you so much for the invitation. I always have a lot of fun with you here. <laughs> and, and we always run out of time before we've we do. been able to talk about everything. So your president pro tem elect is historic for a number of perspectives. One is you're the first woman in Vermont Senate history and you're the first out lesbian. Yes, yes. But, but I want to start with, most people have forgotten their high school civics classes. Exactly what is the president pro tem and what is it that you now get to do? Right, so uh, the easiest way to think about it for most people is that the president pro tem serves as the rather the speaker of the house it's it's akin to the work of the speaker of the house and president pro temporary means president for a time and the reason why it's president for a time president pro tem is because the lieutenant governor is the one who is presiding over the senate basically uh, moderating our daily meetings but it's the pro tem who actually we say directs traffic on the floor, decides which bills come to the floor uh, in conjunction with the committee on committees in the Senate figures out who gets what committee assignments, who gets what chair, um, and how we prioritize our work. It's generally said, if you wanna get something through the Senate, you have to have the pro tems office sort of on board with your plan before it's gonna even get out of committee. It's similar to the role of the speaker of the house. And it's different from my previous role in the Senate, which was for the last four years, I've been the majority leader in that now, in addition to working closely with the majority caucus, which are the Democrats in uh, the Senate, I will be also working closely with the minority caucus to make sure we as a Senate, although we might disagree on some policy uh, issues going forward that generally the values of the Senate are reflected in the bills that are passed within the chamber. So if I heard correctly, you're also on the committee on committee so that you'll have a strong right. say in who gets what committee, who's going to be brought up as chairs, who's exactly. going to be kept as chairs. Also working across the aisle mm -hmm. and you have a phenomenal reputation, reputation for building bridges and strong Thank caucuses. You. However, there is a totally new leadership on both the Democratic side and the Republican side. Yes. Anticipate anything that might be different going into this year? You know, I've had good relationship uh, with both the uh, minority leader and the minority whip, which were uh, Joe Benning uh, and I are, are, are good. I would say we're good friends. We, we talk even about, about personal things unrelated to work. Um, he's going to be stepping down as minority leader. Randy Brock will be former auditor, for those of you who follow Vermont politics, um, will be stepping in. He and I, Randy and I serve on economic development committee and the finance committee. So we actually have a, a, a working relationship. We also co-chaired the um, postmortem that we did called Lessons Learned Task Force, looking at our pandemic uh, relief that we did at the beginning of the spring. So we co-chaired that together. I have a good working relationship with him. I don't anticipate day-to-day -day tension in the work that we do. Of course, there will be policy differences and philosophical differences. The other piece is that the minority whip, Brian Collimore, he and I, we've had a good friendship from the beginning. We came in at the same time in the Senate and we were the two people who came in without ever having served 
in the house. And so we feel a special kinship with each other because we both came in that first day and felt like, what have we done now? Now what do we do? And he's he's a very uh, he's a very sweet man. He serves from Rutland, and um, one of the things that he always says to me when we're in person at the state house, one of the first things he says when he sees me in the morning is, "Morning is, Becca, can I have a hug?" And then <laughs> we hug and we talk. And he's he's someone who I trust to be fair minded and we try not to surprise it, each other. So if we have an issue coming up in our caucus, we'll usually pull the other side and say, just so you know, this is bubbling up. I don't want it to be a surprise. So he'll be serving in WHIP in that role as WHIP, um, which is the person who, who counts the votes behind the scenes to see if they have the votes. So I'm not anticipating any tension right off the bat. I feel like it's a small enough chamber. We have to work together. I, I think you just revealed one of the reasons why you have such a reputation for building alliances across the aisle, reaching out in advance saying, let's talk about this before it explodes on the floor. Yeah. Okay, you also said that as president pro tem, you're gonna have a real say in the flow of bills and what's yeah. being brought up and what's prioritized. Yes. Vermont Digger is reporting this morning as we're taping that the two constitutional amendments by virtue of everything else that you need to do are going to be held until next year. So taking that into consideration, what are your priorities? Well, so, and I just wanna clarify that because the, although Kit was accurate in the reporting, there, there's a, a few technical pieces that folks might want to know. Those constitutional amendments will not pass the full legislature until next session. That is true. What is not entirely clear yet, based on the work that we'll have from the CARES funds that are coming from the federal government, we may queue it up at the end of this session in the Senate and pass it along to the House, but it is true the entire movement of those constitutional amendments will not happen until next year, but they will be passed. Okay, I just want I, to reassure I, to people because I have had some people anxious about that. We will, we will absolutely be passing them. So I was going um, to say, particularly in light of what's happening with UVM and absolutely. health and human services. Okay, right. so okay, so um, in meeting with senators, there were four sort of umbrella priorities that have come out of um, our, our meetings in the Senate. So top priority being immediate COVID-19 responses. We have thousands of Vermonters worried about housing, worried about food security. And so we know we're going to get another federal package, but it's gonna be critical as that money comes in, it will be you know probably hundreds of millions of dollars to Vermont, making sure that we're focused on that, exclusively for the first bunch of weeks so we can turn that money around and get it out to the, the communities that need it. So that's the first thing. Second, looking at um, strengthening Vermonters health long-term. And so I'm thinking of health broadly also to include, are we making sure people that we were able to house with uh, COVID-19 relief funds stay housed? What do they need to stay housed, right? So that we know that when we're talking about housing, it's not just the actual brick and mortar housing that they need. They need supports to stay in that housing if they are someone that struggles with mental health issues or whether they struggle with addiction. And so it has to be a combination of support systems to keep people housed. Going back again to the issue of food security. So looking at food systems, looking at are our agricultural systems um, up to the task of making sure that in emergencies we have food to feed everybody that, that needs the food? Uh, third one, looking at economic security long-term. So looking at the Vermont State Colleges, shoring up that fiscal house, making sure that each of those communities still have a presence for the Vermont State Colleges within them, because we know for many rural communities, that is the ticket out of poverty for so many people. There, there, many communities are not going to have a lot of families that are sending their students to UVM. 
the Vermont State Colleges have been an avenue out of poverty for people for decades. We want to make sure that that remains a strong system. Um, in keeping with economic resiliency, looking at workforce development. And are we uh, not just training our high school graduates, but incumbent workers, people that are looking to further uh, their careers in some way, but they need access to, to further training or certification. And also looking at our childcare system. We know that there are people that want to be in the workforce full time, but do not have uh, affordable childcare. And then, of course, the fourth thing, which is on everybody's mind in, in, in my caucus, which is advancing equity, looking at issues of racial justice, economic justice. We've done tremendous work in Vermont in reducing our prison population. We're going to continue on that work, making sure that we are only incarcerating the people that absolutely have no other means through which to be rehabilitated. And so we're, we're going to continue that work. And um, there are lots of other things under all of those umbrellas, but I know that many of our viewers care a lot about the issues of, of economic and racial justice. And we have met with uh, the Government Operations Committee and the Judiciary Committee, and, and people are very much uh, focused on this. You may also want to know that Health and Welfare uh, Committee is also looking at what are the racial disparities in health outcomes and, and how do we, um, how do we make significant changes in that area. So we have a lot on our plate. And what I always say to people is we wanna make things better than we found them. And two years goes really fast. And we just have to remember, keep the eyes on the prize, make the progress. We're not gonna do all the work we wanna do, but we are gonna make positive change. That's the goal, moving in a positive yeah. direction. A couple of things that people who are routine viewers of all things yeah have mentioned in conversation. One is broadband. Oh, yes. How... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's one of the top priorities for us. And I should have mentioned it under um, the, the economic resiliency. Right. What has come out of the pandemic is realizing it's not just about economic development, though, of course, it is, especially for our, our rural communities. But it also is key to tele, telehealth, right? I've had all of my... Uh, doctor's appointments in the last six months over the internet, over, over telehealth. And of course, now with so many of our schools going online, I know my, my two kids are also, um, we're all fighting for bandwidth <laughs> at home and I live in Brattleboro, so I have better access than a lot of places do. But so, yeah, this is, this is an issue that I feel like has changed in priority for a lot of legislature, legislators. For me coming in, it was one of the issues that was always important to me because I knew within Wyndham County, there were big pockets that didn't have any access to broadband. But folks who have in the past perhaps seen it as a nice thing that we could do, sort of a luxury, they're realizing it's not a luxury, it's a have to in the same way that we were able to electrify the country you know, in the, in the 1930s. And so, I love that people are seeing the need more expansively. It makes it easier for us to do the heavy lift of, of passing uh, the legislation and getting the funds available to get broadband out if you're not talking about something that is simply just a nice thing to do for economic development. It's, it's critical. Yeah. Thank and you for also, mentioning that. It, it is a top <laughs> priority and I can't believe I didn't mention it. So thank you. Well, I was gonna say with so many people working from home, remote access, good broadband has become essential. The other just sort of in passing before I move on to the next topic I really want to talk about is as health and welfare is talking about collecting data and reviewing, know that during COVID, there has been absolutely no data collected about the direct impact of COVID on the LGBTQ plus mm. communities because the feds removed us. Right. What, one of the things that is remarkable about your becoming the first is it gets us to have a conversation about, so what do we do as Kamala Harris said, to ensure that you may be the first, but you're not the last. Yeah. How, how does someone 
who is just becoming interested in the mm -hmm. political process get to where you are now? And how do we as a community support them in that process? Yes, oh, so many parts of that. So first thing, one of the one of the first questions that so many reporters have asked me in the last few weeks is why does it matter? Why does it matter that you're the first woman? You know, they do it because they're provocative. That's, you know, uh, why does it matter that you're the first woman? Why does it matter that you're the first openly queer person in? So not just in the in the Senate, we've never had an openly gay person leading the, the House chamber either. So it is it's a first. And so I always say to them, obviously, visibility matters visibility matters to young people, but also to any person who feels like an outsider, right? So I, I've really been pushing the press to realize it's not just a story for people who identify as, as queer or trans. It is a story of someone who never felt like they would ever be in that kind of position of power coming from, I didn't have you know, uh, political connections, didn't come from, from money. I didn't have any entrance that I could see into this line of work. So I'm really encouraging them to report it more as, what does it feel like when you've been on the outside looking in for so long and now you're on the inside? How do you, as you said, how do you continue to you know, create avenues for people to get in? And so, I'll get to that in just a second, but I don't wanna lose this other thread that I've been thinking about a lot. Because people will say, well, does it make you a better pro tem? Does it make you a better leader, right? And so I always say better or not better is not really the question. Will we get better outcomes? Will we get better outcomes in the policy that we pass, the discussions that we have when someone is bringing a different perspective into the room and has an eye to the voices that are not being heard, right? And so it is, it's an interesting thing that when uh, Jill Karinsky was also nominated by her caucus to be speaker, and when I was nom nominated by, by mine to be pro tem, the headlines were, women will dominate the leadership, you know, in the legislature. And I thought that was so interesting because for 150 years plus, right? Has any headline ever said white men will dominate, right? That is the default, that is the norm. And so it's making people uncomfortable. And so my challenge is always, yeah, I know you're like, great. My challenge is always to not pretend that it doesn't make people uncomfortable, to name it, like this is different. This is different to have a woman in this role. This is different to have an openly gay person in this role but it will give us a better outcome and we should all want that. We should all want the best policy. So one of the things that I've been working with my incoming um, assistant who will be my chief of staff, a woman named Carolyn Wesley, whose mom served in the house, uh, Julie Peterson, and also served as Howard Dean's chief of staff. So she knows her, she knows her way around the building and actually she was, I believe, I don't know if it was uh, Speaker Obahowski or Speaker Wright, I'm not sure, but when, when Carolyn was a toddler, at one point she was in a, a, a meeting of the house and she asked the speaker to please stop talking because <laughs> all done now, I think she said all done now. So I, I, I love that when she like pops into my meetings and she's like, okay, okay, Senator, wrap it up. So she's gonna be great. But one of the things we've talked about is we want to make sure that when we bring on interns within the pro tems office, that it is um, with an eye to having interns who are coming from marginalized communities. That could be people of color, that could be new Americans, it could be queer people, it could be a white male from the kingdom who's he's you know first generation to go to college. I want those voices in that building who have never sought that they could ever be in power. And so our PAGE program, not always, but often is people who are in some way already connected to state government. That's how they find out about the program, right? So by, by having a 
uh, a program that generally turns out people who are already connected, you perpetuate that system. Now I'm, I'm being um, broad in the way that I describe it. I know there are exceptions in there, but I wanna make sure that I'm able to use my office to get people a foot in the door who might not otherwise have it. So Carol and I have been working on what that could look like. Of course, when I first started imagining this, I didn't know that we'd be working remotely again. And so it makes it harder for everyone. But there are also opportunities. It could be that we can take on an intern now from a far-flung community that can do his or her work or their work for me over Zoom and not actually have to drive to the state house. So even though it's limiting in some ways, in other ways, it might create opportunities for people who might not have had them. So that's one thing. The other thing that I wanna say is I want more people in high school to get involved in their government classes. I get a lot of people who reach out to me, high school students who say, can I shadow you for a, a day? Can I do some work? And they're still overwhelmingly male. And those classes tend to be filled with um, mostly young male students. And so that's not a bad thing to have uh, progressive men who want to do the work. I just want young girls and also queer people to think, I have to understand government in order it, for it to work better for me. So this is my little pitch to, to the viewers. If you know those young people in your life, please, please encourage them to take some government classes in high school and to get involved um, at their local town meetings as well. So I could talk on and on. I was a teacher before I was a legislator. So I, I often have my teacher hat on, so. Yeah. So with that, I need to say thank you. What? And I know, what? It, it's you and me. This what is what it happens. Happen? Okay, but we, I'll be because back. We, because we also need to talk about yeah. in this era of the virtual legislative session, Yeah. And it's one of the things I'll be talking about on all things is how do people become involved right. and establishing and maintaining contacts with their senators and their representatives. Right. But what I want to leave with yeah. is I think what you're coming in is the first woman and the first out lesbian as President Pro Tem does is it gives us hope. Because whoever I am, I can look at you and say, she did this. There's room for me. That's so, what I want. So thank, thank you. you. That's what I want. And, and when the session gets going, you definitely have to come back so we can check in with, so how's it really going? Exactly. Exactly. Right. I hope so. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. Okay. Hi, I'd like to introduce Max Vasipoli uh, to all things LGBTQ interview show. Hi, Max. How are you today? Good. How are you, Linda? Good I'm to you. pretty well. Thank you. Um, Max has uh, quite the resume, and we're not going to be able to talk about all of the things that uh, they're involved with, but um, we're going to start with, I think, We'll start with your theater experience. And let me just read something, uh, just a little bit from your extensive resume, if I might. So Max Vasipoli, MED, is graduate and former staff member of Brin School of Theater Arts at the University of the Arts. He currently serves as an academic advisor for high school programs at the University of Pennsylvania. He is an experienced educator and educator entering his sixth competitive season, having adjudicated dancers across the US and Canada for multiple, for a multitude of competitions. He is currently on the roster of Impact Dance Adjudicators. Max was a founding member of North Shore Music Theater Youth Performance Academy, danced competitive, competitively with Nancy Chippendale's dance studio and was awarded a promising artist award to attend the University of the Arts. 
So um, does that explain you well enough, Max? Or... I, I hope so. <laughs> Uh, I think it capt captures a lot of what I think what we're hoping to talk about today, which is kind of growing up in the arts and then going and really pursuing the arts professionally in college and kind of making that your career and, and part. You know. And um, I know you grew up in suburban Massachusetts for people. That's who right. That. And um, wh when did you move to Philly? Did you go there to go to school or? I did. Yeah. So I moved here. <sighs> 15 years ago, don't tell anyone I said that. Um, but I moved here when I was around 17. So it was a big change to move from very suburban life to right in the heart of the city in a major city, um, re relatively, uh, you know, definitely different than Boston in a lot of ways and more definitely more diverse than Boston for sure. And so did you dropped into that? Did you think, oh, happy day or a combination of like, how am I going to fit into this? Um, That's a great question. Um, I think when I first started, when I um, really left the nest, I remember thinking like, how could my parents leave me here? And then I realized like, I like what, like literally when they first left, I was like, I'm in the major, a major city. I've never been here. I don't know where my classes are, all that kind of stuff. But I think it really forces you to grow up. Like my undergrad experience was a lot of people's experience first time in a college. I was not the only first time uh, person who was going through the same changes. So it was good to have a community that way. But I think to answer your question, it opened my eyes up to so much more. I really was connected with a lot of artists from other areas of the country, other countries that came to visit the school. Um, and I think one of the for one of the first times, especially in the School of Dance at University of the Arts, I really saw myself on stage. There was a lot of men of color and I did not see a lot of men at all dancing growing up. So to see men of color who looked like me in these programs and teaching in these programs made such a difference to me. And I really like got suckered into that and really stuck with that all four years, even though I was a theater student. Um, I really like saw every dance show, saw every dance concert that was there. Um, it's one of the foremost dance uh, programs in the US. So I was really took advantage, I think, especially during that time. And you do dance competitions, right? In which you judge. Uh, people. So is that in, in university or is that separate and kind it's of separate. A, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's separate. A lot of people, you're not the first person to ask me that. And I wish more schools were kind of in that vein. Um, I definitely got, you know, the pat in the back to go do this work because it's really closely tied to, you know, admissions and getting people to come to college, obviously, um, to have your name on the, on your back, traveling around the country, talking to people who are young and interested in the arts is the perfect kind of recruitment tool, right? Um, but I did it myself. I will say the one one thing that I was left positively from one of my past um, partners was that he was like, you have to do this. You really want to do this. Go and apply and apply and apply. And I did the first year and I didn't hear from like anybody. I heard from like two companies and I got like one weekend of judging throughout. There's like a, maybe about a three or four month um, time frame. And last year or the 2019, I judged for 13 weekends in and out of Canada. I also judged um, the, the season finale of Dance Moms last year as well, their season eight finale in New York City. So that was on TV. Um, so it's been a wild ride. It's been a really interesting ride to see that. And I think what's great about it is it's educational, but it's not, um, you know, we're meant to be inspirational. We're meant to be these people who are really helping you come to the next level versus saying, are you good or bad? Because, you know, most of these people are great. Most of these kids are doing the things we want them to do, especially as young artists. Um, so it's a really inspirational thing to do. Um, I obviously, you have to talk a lot about dance and know as much as you can about dance. Um, and I think this year, especially because everything's been pushed online, our roles have become really interesting as experts because we have to do things like this and, and you know, really share with people um, about what this experience is like. And hopefully when we get back to it, what it's going to be like in the future. And I know Philadelphia has had a lot of activism going on with Black Lives Matter and different other kinds of, of protests uh, during this uh, time of COVID. Um, and I know that for most of us, we can't do the things we normally did in crowds of people. So how are you um, making that work for you in terms of activism and in terms of your art? That's a, wow, that's a great question. Um, I think one of the things everyone was really worried about at the very beginning was being in big groups and being around other people. And one of the first things I heard, especially when people saw that there was protesting and then looting eventually in Philadelphia was like, how can you be around that? You know the risks. And at first I wanna say that every protest I went to, everyone, everyone wore masks. And the only people I didn't see wearing masks were when I was walking to go to the protest. And those were all the people sitting in cafes and in the park. 
Um, so everyone at these protests was wearing masks. Everyone, there was constantly hand sanitizer, water bottles, food, little snacks. Philadelphia has definitely been a major site for social activism in the last year. Um, you're correct around Black Lives Matter, around Black trans women, around housing. That was a huge um, kind of major thing for Philadelphia this year was um, a housing encampment that became this kind of you know, major kind of media storm and how do we serve the homelessness and people who are suffering or experiencing homelessness. Um, but to answer your question, I think, I think because it's a historical place, people kind of feel that they have some sort of right to it, um, which is great, which is an exciting place to be. And through one of the many live theater Zoom events I attended, they were saying that Philadelphia is on the grounds of change and it's on, you know, it's born on those grounds. So I think that's a part of it, right? And I think the other thing is because people are at home and they have the skill sets to organize, they have the drive to organize. And for me, it was um, being alone a lot and working a lot, working overnight, working here and there, trying to get everything offline, uh, you know, online and uh, going to protests and being involved with that was so moving to go from completely alone to just crowds of thousands of people who are around the same thing that you're wanting to do. And a lot of my work at Penn is directly helps Philadelphia youth and Philadelphia high school students, high achieving students. And so being part of that too, I went to a lot of protests that are around education and Black Lives Matter in schools um, and hearing from current students. And I think that work is the most important thing I could be doing as an educator, even if it's scary to go, even if they're, you know, hear all these terrible things that happen to protesters. Um, but it's the thing to do. And I know that especially right now, this was something that I was meant to do um, and get other people involved as well and just really spread the word. Cause you're right, not everyone can be on the front lines and everyone can be outside right now, um, but there's a lot of other ways to be involved. Right and I'm glad you're doing that. Um, yeah, me too. And I know Philadelphia has one of the only, I think there's only a few LGBTQ senior houses. Yes, yes. Philadelphia, right? They do, yeah. It's and it's actually in the heart of our what we lovingly call the neighborhood as well. It's right in the middle of like the gay area, very well taken care of. And I think that's that's unique. You're right. That's definitely unique. There's a lot of other works in that area that are around testing, around counseling, around just groups, you know, group community groups that you can join. And then like right around the corner is this huge housing district or district uh, building, I guess we could say for elders. Yeah, and I heard about that, and I thought that was really inspiring. I really. I, I've only been to Philadelphia a few times, but I, I've always really liked it. And I always yeah. think it's an up and coming city. I mean, it's like a lot of creative people are moving there. A lot of, there's a lot of real action going yes. on in there. So what keeps you engaged and passionate when it comes to the arts and culture? Ah, uh, wow. Um, that is a great question. Is it I, like, yeah, go ahead, sorry. No, oh, I was gonna say, um, I think some of it has to do with, um, being an educator and being a teacher and I'm really uh you know you know it's it's we teach and we mentor because it gives us something as well you know we get something out of it so that's a little bit selfish but not really because you're also giving back to people and educating them and helping them through um and I also think part of it is identity and and intersectionality like I can't you know uh there are so many different ways to identify this now nowadays and things that you can be passionate about and different intersections of that. And so part of it is ongoing work, right? This work will never be done until we have black liberation and black trans liberation um, and things like that. Like we have to keep fighting for it, right? So that's part of it. Um, but the, I think the other part of it is knowing that this is how I have always been, even before this cultural movement, I've always been someone who's been a bit of a, uh, an outspoken person, especially around diversification and making sure that things are equitable and inclusive. Um, so this is kind of putting your money where your mouth is of like, no, I really stand for this. And I, I would be remiss if I didn't say like, I was always nervous to, to talk out like I do and to speak out like I do. Um, a lot of the work I do is contractual. It's, I don't have to be doing these dance competitions. They could easily say like, we don't like how outspoken you are or you said this and it turned us off. Um, but I think the opposite is true. The more I go into this and the more I speak out and the more I take these, I think, well-educated well ways of speaking about these topics, people are more interested. And yeah. I think if you take those stance and if more people took those stances and more people said, this is what I really believe in, I think that's actually the key to kind of unlocking a lot of these like, well, I don't know, or I've always thought this way. Um, it becomes more, it goes from way macro to really micro. Um, so I think it's a lot of different levels. It goes from like what I'm passionate about to my own identity to how do we affect other people. 
well, you know, it's all, it's all really important. And I love the way things are, um, you know, the arts and culture and changing society. I mean, it's, it's sort of always been artists that have done that, don't you think? I mean, in many ways, it's, it's those people who, I mean, of course it's, but, it, but it's very involved always culture and right. art with, with um, change. Um, opera. Now, here's something <laughs> that I know almost nothing about. And um, I've seen some pictures where you are beautifully made up. Um, and do you do your own makeup? Um, in, the, in the terms of performing with the opera company, no. They yeah. have people who are their, opera, so they have their own makeup people. Um, I also do my own makeup for other things. I do a lot of like mostly beauty makeup and Halloween makeup and stuff like that. Um, yeah, and, I, and for, I've also done it for the University of the Arts. They had a number of shows that required either drag makeup or psychedelic makeup or futuristic makeup that I've done in the past few years. So uh, specifically for their students of color, they didn't have someone who knew about makeup and could also speak to different skin tones, different skin shades, things like that. Let's, you know, and do you sing too in the opera? Or? Yeah, I do. Oh. Um, um, so yeah, yeah, so I went to school for musical theater. Yeah, I went to school <laughs> for musical theater. So um, was definitely trained to sing, dance and act. Um, with the opera company, it's a bit of everything. So I got started with them right after I graduated from a lighting designer that was working there at the time. So always remember your connections. That's how it happens sometimes. And that turned into like a 10 year relationship. I've been in a number of their productions. I've taught for them. I've been, we, they recently at the beginning of the pandemic put out their um, O festival, which is typically um, in person, but it was moved online. Uh, I was in Barber of Seville, which was shown last year. Um, we also have an opening performance, typically the first show or the first production of every season is um, projected on a screen here at Independence Mall. So right in front of the Liberty Bell. Um, so I've been in a number of those performances as well. And then taught for their um, Hip Hopper program, which is a program that looks at the intersection of hip hop and opera. Um, so we go into Philadelphia schools and speak about that. Um, been a teaching artist for them. So I've really lucked out to have a really great, uh, a really great relationship with them and really seen the company from, I think what we all think of opera as kind of like, this very old school, three or four hour long, have to get dressed up to where they are now, which is really starting new works, really um, looking at works from people of color, looking at, they did a whole piece about um, the move bombing that happened here in Philadelphia a number of years ago. Um, so they are really becoming one of the four forerunners of how does opera change now, right? We have like two or 300 years of canonical work that everybody does every season, much like ballet how do we re reinvigorate that? And I think what's interesting to be there now or to see now is that they're really, really forging ahead with those uh, initiatives. Um, it's been a great place to work. Um, very, uh, you know, very accepting, very uh, top down approach. The executive director knows everybody. I know all those people. Um, so it's been a great environment and it's offered me a lot of opportunity. And a great place to showcase something that I, you know, like a lot of people aren't familiar with, or I know many people who might say ARPA, oh, you know, or. <laughs> yes, oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and and so to do that is is really, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of like getting new generations involved in, in, in activities that they might not have otherwise done. That's great. I think so too. And I think what people don't realize is how big these productions are. They can go from like 20 to 30 to hundreds of people like Turin Dot has like hundreds of people involved. And so it employs so many more people than I think we all think, even though it is this kind of a little dusty art form. Um, and certainly I've, I've kind of forgot about it. And then people would come see shows and they'd be like, what do I wear to the opera? And I'm like, oh, I never really thought about that. You can kind of wear whatever you want. Like this opera specifically, you can kind of wear whatever you want. You don't have to dress up. Um, and I think it's been, that's been my experience working on opera too. So I've like danced in the shows, I've done like stage combat in the shows, I've taught for them, I've worked on production. Um, but my, I think my biggest memory was um, walking into the, we did Silent Night, which was commissioned a few years ago um, and ended up win, win, uh, winning the Pulitzer right before we started rehearsals. So wow. we started rehearsals knowing that this was like, huge and was going to be like really really you know really in it and we were we um we were all on stage for about two and a half hours which is very real we're uh we're or very rare i should say you're typically not on stage for more than maybe like half an hour 45 minutes tops but we were on stage the whole time it took place in real time so things like that like they really jump out but i think 
Um, it's kept me on my toes as a performer too, to have to be able to do a little bit of everything. Yeah. Um, yeah, which is the which is the life, I suppose. Yeah. I was saying you're a renaissance person. Here. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. Um, so we only have a few minutes left. What is sure. it about you, Max, that people might not know that you could tell us, I don't know, you're not a vegetarian Ooh. or you're, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, you, you don't have to. I was just wondering if, you know, huh, that's a good oh, question. Oh, dear. So I was wondering if there is like, you know, you're shyer than you appear or, you know, um, I don't know. I'm just throwing it out. Um, the... Two things come to mind. One is, and I think this is kind of why we got connected to talk, um, which is about identity, which is kind of like the layers of identity. And I think that's something that I'm still going through and we all still go through, right? Um, one of the things I get asked or I, people always kind of like question mark about me um, is like, what what are you? And I hate saying that question because I think it has so many derogatory negatives, um, but it's something that we talked about today. And I trust, you know, I, we are family and I trust talking about with you. Um, you know, I'm definitely a Latinx or Latine person. And that's even part of how identity changes. Latinx is um, what we all kind of think is a very gender neutral way of saying Latino, right? Um, and you can't actually say Latinx in Spanish because that X doesn't, anyway. So the new kind of verbiage is Latine. So I'm a Latine person. I'm an indigenous Latine person. Um, and so people always think because of my last name, the way that I look, my family, things like that, any number of things that I'm Greek, For that I'm Italian. anything. I mean, it could be, for, it could be anything. And even that I think is something to think about in the future of like, we're all gonna be, have our own identities. And just like, you know, we talk about and um, it's important to really respect people's identities, even if you don't fully understand them. So that's part of it, I think, is at least just ask, may I ask you about this? Can, I'm very interested in you. Um, and I'm, you know, it has to go both ways because I have to be willing to talk to that and you have to be willing to ask about it. Um, but I think that's part of it. And, and so that's something that I'm sure people have a big question mark about. Um, and I think, the, and I was adopted from Colombia and I grew up in the US, um, but certainly other people are still, you know, coming to the country and um, that's a whole other conversation to have at some point. Um, but to be on that other side of it too, to be like, I know that I'm, you know, lucky to be here and I'm, I'm very appreciative of my adoptive family. Um, and I think the other thing is um, as, and this is again, another thing that I'm still working on as far as like revving the engine. It's, I'm, I love hearing that I'm a Renaissance person and that I'm doing all these things. Um, I wanna tell, I know you have a lot of younger people that follow you and all the work that you do with youth. Um, I want to say that that didn't happen overnight. That took me years and years and years to accumulate the um, the experience that I have. And, and I wish I had spent more time not doing things, but actually working on myself. I recently um, started mental health uh, counseling in the last like few years. And that has like changed my life on how I actually approach work and the work that I actually go towards and the things that make me happy rather than something that just goes on my resume. Um, so that's something too, I think that maybe not everyone knows and I think should be less of a stigma. It's like, yeah, if you feel like you need mental health counseling or even just want to speak to somebody, don't wait until something traumatic happens. Go today, start now. Um, and you don't know how it'll change your life. And for me, it has. It really kept me from running both candles at the end and running in the gerbil cage and, and trying to do all this work because I think as artists, we're kind of trained to do that, right? Take everything, do everything. Um, but at the end of the day, if you're too tired to do the work or too exhausted, it's not going to be very good. Yeah. Um, so that's something that I think not everyone may may know about me. Well, thank you for sharing that, Max. I Absolutely. Think it's an important message for people uh, to get. And, and it's a time in which uh, with COVID, we, we, you know, we have more time and we can be more introspective and you know, slow ourselves down and... Uh, mental health issues are really important. I always think of it as, you know, like I go every few years and I call it a tune-up, you know? It's yes, like, exactly like, right. Like, you know, tweet. And then to, to your point too, that happens in different ways. Like you can read a book and that's your mental health training. You yeah. can go run outside as but as getting into that practice is difficult. And I think, um, yeah, one of the things I've learned this is to go before you think you need it. It's just to go and talk, like you're saying, just to go for a tune-up. Yeah, go for a tune-up. Well, thank you so much. Thank for you. And um, we'll see you again soon. Absolutely. Let's hope so. Thanks, Max. Be well. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you in two weeks. But in the meantime, 
resist. resist.